I am Ula Brenna's daughter. I'm a self-professed Norse nerd, and I am joined here by uh, with my much more language nerdy <laughs> friend. If you uh, introduce yourself, yeah, um, uh, I am Dam Kennehill, the library. Uh, this month we are doing uh, all old English poetry and. Um, and sort of its environs and guys this is like my this is my happy place i ordered a new book for this month i have now um four pounds of old english poetry i, just, I am i am so excited just don't throw that at the wall <laughs> yeah 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 there is no yeeting of this particular book um and what's what's amazing so this is four pounds of poetry and it's not a side-by-side -side translation this is just the modern english renditions um so wow. I'm ready. I am prepared, uh, and and I am I am really really excited. I my background I have um, a history in uh, my uh, my my formal education is in linguistics with a specialty in the history of English, um, and I just like I deeply love uh, old English poetry and the English the old old English language the development of English. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. So uh, let's start with you. Let's you'll give a quick history of post Roman England. Um, and I'm just gonna tell everybody right now, I'm gonna keep myself on mute most of the time. Uh, I have HVAC installers here right now working in the attic above my head. Uh, so if there are loud crashes and bangs during the course of this show, just know that no one's hopefully dying up there. They're just dropping condenser units or something like that. So, all right. I'm going mute for a second, but tell us all about post-Roman England. Right. So uh, England, um, first off, uh, you know, we talk about England and Wales and Scotland is just three different countries. They're all on the, the sort of the island of Britain. Um, it was uh, not initially settled by Germanic speaking peoples. It was settled uh, by uh, speakers of Celtic languages. Uh, the Romans arrived, uh, we, you know, Constantine, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think uh, you know, so they, they arrive, but around 410 CE, there's this whole moment where the Romans are dealing with other stuff, including uh, the Justinian plague, uh, which was a bit of a problem in the empire. Um, so uh, the Romans pull out around 410 CE. Um, and after that, things get a little bit murky because while the Romans were excellent uh record keepers and bureaucrats, um, and they did leave a very strong impression of their culture behind when they left um, in, uh, with the, the Romanized Celts and frankly Romans that stayed, right? Like it, it's not like everybody who was of Roman origin just was like, oh, 410 CE guys, let's uh, out of here. Um, so there's this, a document that was produced in what's today France uh, called the Chronica Gallica. Um, so, Gallica, right, Gaul. Uh, if we think back briefly to our uh, Latin classes, uh, uh, all of Gaul is divided into three parts um, and Caesar and his Gallic Wars. Uh, so the Chronica Gallica, written about 452 CE, says that by 441, the British provinces, which to this time had suffered various defeats and misfortunes, are reduced to Saxon rule. So that's that's one of the early written records where we were like, OK, so now we've got these Germanic speaking peoples, the Saxons, arriving in the British Isles. And there's a, a big question about how that arrival, like, what did it look like? Was this an invasion? Was this settlement? Um, we know that this is part of what we call the, the Germanic migrations and the migration period. Um, as they're leaving sort of uh, North uh, Eastern Europe, so Scandinavia, Northern Germany, modern day Germany, um, the Netherlands, those kind of areas, and they're starting to push out and into other parts of Europe. Um, and you know what's, what's driving this push, all this kind of stuff. Um, so we know that that's part of the migrations you know, there's whether how many people initially arrived, whether it was a violent invasion, we know that they started probably with some some coastal raids, but and then like settled and stuff like that. There's some really interesting work that's being done lately on a Celtic substrata in English grammar and what what impact the indigenous Celtic languages had on this developing English language. Um, it's there's no major consensus that's come out of that yet, but it's it's something that people are kind of percolating on and trying to decide like, 
previously, like if you look at historical scholarship, like 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of it's just like the, the Angles, the Saxons and the Utes, they arrive in Britain and they just, you know, laid down on top of it and, and sort of crushed and pushed the Celts to the edges and they just took over. Um, but if we look at uh, these, these royal king lists, right, you start to see some very Celtic names. Kedwalla is one of them. He shows up in, I think, the, the Wessex king lists. Um, Penda is another. These are not Germanic names. Right. So the, now there's kind of this discussion about, you know, are these Celtic royal lines that became Germanicized over time? Um, which suggests that the, the Germanic speaking peoples didn't just like arrive and establish their rule over the island and take over. Like if, if you've got a Celtic, a, a king with a Celtic name, right? Like that suggests that maybe there's a little more going on. Um, so there's been some really interesting history. So I mentioned uh, the Celts, the Utes and the Dan uh, Celts, Utes and Saxons. Um, these make up the majority of the Germanic speaking peoples that arrived um, and they're coming out of uh, the modern, modern day Netherlands, uh, Northwestern Germany and Western Jutland, which is that, that Danish peninsula. Um, so if we, we think about Europe, right? So here's Jutland and you're coming down and here's, uh, here's the Netherlands and that little bit of Germany, right? So today the people who live there, um, the, the, the language of that area is, is called Frisk or Frisian. And Frisian is our closest, English's closest overseas relative. Um, we talk about the Anglo-Frisian language family. So that's made up of English and Frisian. And then Scots, which is a language of its own. It's not just like a Scottish accent, like it's its own, its own thing. Um, and then there's a, a dead language called Yola that's part of that group as well. Um, and so there's this great, like English and Frisian are surprising and close. So there's, this is the saying, um, Brea butter and green cheese is good English and good Frisk. So that may sound like I'm kind of having a weird moment trying to speak English with a Dutch accent, but that's Frisian, right? And everybody understood what I was saying. Brea might be the hardest one because there's no D at the end, but bread, right? Bread. Um, so, but right, like that. Yeah. It, it, it made sense to me. Right, right? like it's, it's, it's understood. Um, so you've got this shared mythos, shared cultural traditions with the wider Germanic speaking world, which is why we see connections between Old English poetry and Norse poetry, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. One of the two poems we're gonna talk about, Deor, has a lot of very explicit connections with sort of this wider Germanic mythos. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, that's the bit that's how we get to the, get to the, what will become the English people. Uh, and uh, let's talk about then why I haven't called them Anglo-Saxons. Yes. So uh, the term Anglo-Saxon, yeah, I, right there with you on this. Uh, so first use in um, the eighth century, mostly sporadic uh, until it became a pretty standard term in academia and then in the 19th century. Um, and that's what many of us learned and, and know of as Anglo-Saxon. And but as you mentioned, that completely drops the use out of it. Um, but in the last five years or so, there's been a movement to stop using this because, well, uh, it's racist. Um, Anglo-Saxon is, you know, specifically the, the historical use historical use of the word to justify the superiority of the English language of the English speaking peoples, therefore white people. Um, and what about people that were already there? You've got the Celts, you've got the people in the British Isles that were already living there. You Just because this other culture layered on top of it doesn't mean that, that the underlying, you know, the, the previous cultures are completely eradicated. Um, so what do we call it instead? Um, so Old English is a name given to the language, not really accurate when you're talking about the culture itself. Viking Age isn't right because it's a different place. It's a different thing. Uh, late Iron Age England, okay. Um, the early England, okay. Early medieval England is also, if it's, I know it's your your personal preference, uh, mine as well, because it, it kind of gives you a little bit better context, right? It gives you a, a better location time, uh, location time, that's not even a thing, uh, a better location, a better time period, right? So um, early medieval English or early medieval England. And I've got to say, this one cracked me up. Um, Kenel, your your uh, 
your your uh what's the word i'm looking for Bullshit. terrible yeah a terrible idea is what this is is to call it post sub roman england and uh no we're just not going to do that no. and i am so glad that i that you actually made that up because i looked at that and i went i have never heard that term I don't want to hear that term. And now that we have said that here, it's going to like proliferate and it's all going to be your fault. Uh, so, all right. So now we know what we're talking about. Uh, we may occasionally slip up and use the term Anglo-Saxon. Know that that is not by, by uh, design. That is because that is what is drilled into at least my brain after, yeah. you know, 30 years of study. Um, but we're going to try to go with early medieval England as much as we can. Kind of a mouthful, but there it is. Well, so it's, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that for the people of the time, right, they tended to talk about themselves in uh, terms of their kingdoms. So Mercian, uh, uh, West Saxon, East Saxon, yes. Anglian, Kentish, um they they it's when we're trying to overlay a bigger right like thing. eventually we start talking about the english people and they start talking about the english people right like yes. like like when we talk about alfred right he's he initially he's like alfred king of wessex right. um but they like as as you move towards 1066 you really start talking about the english people yeah. And that's how they refer to themselves. And there was yeah. a really interesting uh, comment that I saw in one of one of the articles that I was reading was that when you see, so so Anglian um, tends to be kind of the term that the church uses. Right. Um, but when you talk about the people surrounding England, right? So many of us are familiar with Outlander, right? He calls her Sassanach all the time, which comes from the word Saxon. And there's right. a very similar word in Welsh, um, and I, I believe in Irish Gaelic as well. Um, so, so it's interesting that the English themselves, and, and the word English comes from Anglian, um, uh, they identify themselves with the term that the church adopts, and the, the church uses to acknowledge them. So it's this like, it's not holy, but it's, it's sort of the church sanctified word. Um, whereas the people who they didn't maybe have the greatest relations with all the time, um, adopt the term that the church explicitly doesn't use. <laughs> so, so the, the, all the Celts yeah. around them are like, oh, those Saxons and the, right. the, the English are like, we're English. And they're like, you're, you're Saxons. So that's, right. that's just a brief aside. Um, and one other really brief thing is that the debate about the use of the word Anglo-Saxon is an interesting one because you see a difference of opinion between people in the UK and people in America. So Americans right. tend to be more in favor of dropping the term, whereas people in the UK are like, they don't, they're less in favor. It, it, so, it's been that way for, you know, a thousand right. years. So what's the problem? Yeah. I, that's I, I get that, you know, like we all get to have our own opinions, but yeah. we also get to disagree with each other. So absolutely. All right, so we now know where we're talking about. Yep. We now know about when we're talking about. Uh, what are we talking about? And this is going to be language nerd. This is all you um, elegy because I, I am not a I am not a language person. I'm not a poetry person. Uh, I got into this because I love the stories and how it's attached to to archaeological e evidence and you know information. So. What's an elegy? Why are we here? Right. Okay. So let's start with the fact that in 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 reality, the old English elegies aren't elegies. Um, so are, aren't classical elegies, right? So a classical elegy is a Greek poetic form uh, that's adopted by the Latin poets that relies on what's called an elegiac couplet. Uh, each couplet, each of these elegiac couplets consists of a hexameter verse followed by a pentameter verse. What do I mean? So a hexameter verse, uh, a di uh, dac dactylic, I'm gonna get this wrong. Dactylic hexameter has six feet. So this is, we're getting, we're getting deep into the English major stuff. I'm not an English major. So if I mess this up, that's because I took bad notes. Uh, so it's got six feet, uh, six feet. Um, each foot is a dactyl, a long and a short syllable or a, or, oh, sorry, long and two short syllables. So a long syllable is a stressed syllable and a short syllable is an unstressed syllable. So you have a long and two shorts, 
Uh, classical meter does allow you to kind of play around with some of this. So you can substitute what's called a spondee, uh, which is two long syllables in place of a dactyl, which is the long and two shorts um, in most positions. However, the first four feet, uh, or sorry, specifically the first four feet can either be dactyls or spondees more or less freely. Um, the fifth foot is almost always a dactyl. Uh, almost 100% of the time it's gonna be that, that long and two shorts. Um, and then the sixth foot can be filled uh, by a what's called a troshi. So we're, we're now introducing an exciting new term uh, and that's a long and then a short syllable or a spondy, two longs. So, right, like I get why there's, there's specialized terminology for all of this. I don't like it, but it's there. It exists. I, I read that and reread that and I'm like, I still don't get it. You might, all I'm getting out of this is Morse code with shorts and longs and like, I, I just, I'm, I'm lost so, because again, so, language is not my thing. <laughs> yeah, poetic meter, um, actually the person to talk to folks out there are really curious about poetic forms and poetic meters. Um, is Asa, who was uh, I was on uh, uh, Between Two Peers with last night. She has a fantastic knowledge of yeah. poetic meter and is, is absolutely an excellent person to talk to about all this. So absolutely we've talked about what is- I think it. that we should, and I think that maybe at some point we can convince her to come on and talk with us. Yes, I think that'd be outstanding. I do um, too. So anyway. that's the hexameter pentameter. Uh, it's, it's another form. You've got the dactyl, which we just talked about, the, the stressed or long syllable followed by two short syllables um, is repeated five times to create pentameter. So penta five, hex six. Um, and so you've got two halves that are both sort of shaped around this hex, hexameter line. Um, and, and then you've, you know, you, basically this is how you're building the poem. Um, but this is not how Old English elegies are formed. So, uh, of course not. Right. Because so, why would they? <laughs> why bother? So what's also interesting to note is there's actually no word that translates as elegy in Old English. Um, so this is a term, this is very much a modern, relatively modern, like modern post 18th century term for this type of poetry. And really what it's leaning more on is elegiac mood. Um, so not specific form, it's the mood. And there's 10 classical Old English elegies. Uh, we're going to talk about two of them today, and we're actually going to talk about some more of them. Sorry, somebody's just messaging me gifts, and they're popping up in the corner next to my notes. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the two of them today, and we're going to talk about three more of them next week, um, but in sort of a different sphere. Uh, so the, the 10 are the Wanderer, the Seafarer, the Rhyming Poem, Deor, Wolf and Edwasser, Wife's Lament, Husband's Message, Riddle 60, Resignation, and The Ruin. Um, so this is, this is by no means all of Anglo-Saxon poetry, Old English poetry. Um, I mentioned my four pound book. They do not make up four pounds of it, um, but they are all found in what's called the Exeter book, which is Exeter Cathedral manuscript number 3501. Uh, this book is a huge resource. It's, they're not all of the poems in the Exeter book. Huge resource though, for the preservation of this poetic culture. Uh, we think that the Exeter book was probably produced around 960 to 990, um, and that it was part of what's called the Benedictine revival of the 10th century. Uh, when we see this, this sort of flowering of, of uh, culture and, um, poetry and just like all this kind of stuff coming out of the Benedictine um, monasteries. Uh, the book uh, was believed to have been donated to the Exeter Cathedral by Leofric, who was the first bishop of Exeter at his death and as part of his will in 1072. His will references a large book of poetry and so we, that's what we think this is, right? Like it, he didn't give it a name and it doesn't have a name. That's one of the things to keep in mind in all of this is that um, the, the poetry that, that we read today is largely edited. So it's, it's got editorial names. So Deor and The Wanderer, both of those are at what are called editorial names. There's no title on any of these poems. Right, they didn't, it didn't come with a, yeah. Right, and, and so, so this book also right. untitled, um, yeah. which just FYI, if you're going to leave massive books of preserving this, this beautiful cultural heritage, um, title the book and then identify when it was written in your will. Like, leave us more provenance information, please. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's right. Work assignment for everyone out there. It's like the bog body assignment, but with books. Um, so what else is in the Exeter book? We've got the 59 Exeter book riddles, which so as as beautiful and as moving as these poems are, the riddles are great because you've got riddle 60, which is, is classically considered an elegy, but you've also got riddles uh, that are talking about the thing that the the beautiful maiden grasps that's hairy at the bottom and she pulls it and and stuff like that, right? Like it's it's it gets a little racy, but in a in a really amusing way. So like please imagine the first Bishop of Exeter Cathedral leaving this book that also has dirty riddles in it. So just keep that in your head. Yeah, I hadn't actually put, yep, I hadn't actually made that connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. There's two of them. Uh, they're, they're outstanding riddles. Um, there's also the riddle that is a preservation of a second century Roman riddle, um, which is what has uh, two shoulders, a front and a back, two arms, two legs, one eye and a thousand heads. It's a one-eyed seller of garlic, <laughs> right? Like that's, that is, <laughs> that is in this book, in the Exeter book, along with all of these other just greats of, of early English literature. Um, so in addition to these riddles, we've also got religious poetry. So that includes Advent lyrics, uh, which that's Advent, the Advent lyrics is also called Christ One, and then Christ Two and Christ Three. There's a hagiographic poem called Juliana, um, which is a, about a saint named Juliana. Um, there's some translations of Latin poetry, and there's a, nomic, a number of gnomic poems, including one that's very famous called Maxims One, um, which we've talked about previously when we talked about gnomic poetry. Yep. Uh, so that's the Exeter book. We've taken a little sidetrack from what is an elegy just to talk about catechology because why wouldn't we? Um, but let's get back to what is an elegy. Uh, defining the old English elegy as a form is something that's really, uh, so before the show we were talking about how there is the, the knowledge of the old English poems has been around for a long time. So old English uh, poetry, the scholarship of old English poetry is a well-trod land. And yes. anytime though that you want to get your doctoral degree, your master's degree, you want to get published because the only way to survive in academia is to publish or perish, you have to come up with a new aspect of the poems uh, or whatever to investigate. Right. What, what are you adding to the existing scholarship? And since existing scholarship now is 200 years old. Pretty, it's, it's pretty extensive. It's hard right? to find like, something There's a lot. New. People have been very excited about these poems for a very long time because they're magnificent. Um, so, so this is really like, we've gotten, scholars today are really getting into some of the weeds. Um, and there's a lot of competing theories, like what, what defines an elegy? Um, so 1965, we've got Stanley Greenfield. He defines an elegy as a relatively short, reflective or dramatic poem embodying a contrasting period of loss and consolation, uh, ostensibly based on a specific personal experience or observation and expressing an attitude towards that experience. So that's a very broad definition. Um, then we move on to uh, Marilyn Desmond. Uh, she talks about the elegies in the Exeter book sharing several features. Uh, the speaker usually describes a past that is irrevocably gone, uh, where the speaker occupied a meaningful position within the social framework of the community. So this, like when we're going to talk about Wanderer, this is a very clear, with both Deor and Wanderer, they definitely fit both these definitions, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then we move on to 1992, Anna Clinic or Anne Clinic. Anne Clinic has written, she wrote a book called The Old English Elegies, um, where she translated them to provide significant um, uh, scholastic commentary on them. I actually don't have a copy of this book. I really want one, but the last time I looked, they were like $300. So that's gonna wait. Um, but uh, she defines elegy as a discourse arising from a powerful sense of absence of separation from what uh, is desired expressed through characteristic words and themes and shaping itself by echo and leitmotif into a poem that moves from disquiet to some kind of acceptance. So again, very broad definition. She also sort of narrows this by saying it's a genre defined by personal statement combined with observation of nature and moral comment 
And insofar as old, the Old English elegy is formally distinguished from other Old, uh, old English poetry, the dis, uh, distinction lies in the sophisticated and deliberate use of repetition and echo as a structuring device. So that's something that we see very strongly in Deor. Deor is unique, Absolutely. largely among Old English poetry and having a repeated line, which, which right. we're going to talk about what that line is and why it's kind of interesting when we talk about translation. It is. Yeah, it is interesting. So my again, not being a language nerd and really reading these, both of these the first time just this week. Although once I read them, I realized I've read them in the past a long time ago. Really, they're just emo. They're yeah. just, <laughs> they're just emo. They, so old, old English, po like, like the, the, the type of poetry that I'm most familiar with from old English poetry is, is these elegies and Beowulf, um, which, uh, I, I will say again, if you have never listened to the Seamus Heaney Beowulf on audiobook, like it's, it's, I think an hour and a half long. Yeah. It is not a big chunk of your life. Yeah. And so just like having Amazing. a bad day, like this is what I do. Like if I'm having a really crappy day, I just put on Beowulf and I just sort of like sit and, and meditate on mm -hmm. Seamus Heaney's beautiful Irish voice, reading me this beautiful poem of sort of loss but also victory against your foes right. and like the 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 joys of the celadriamas the joys of the hall which we're going to talk about where that word comes from today um and all it's just it is incredibly emo it's very emo but so emo but so beautiful at the same time yeah. but it really like if you were just to give a a, a quick layman's summary what is elegy it's it's emo yeah but, there you go there's your <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like it's emo but with with consolation at the end right so at the end, you sweep aside your bangs and you look at the oncoming light like you got to remember to sweep those bangs out of your yeah. eyes though, the very yeah end. yeah maybe do the little flip yeah there you go yeah, yeah. Um, so 2014 right. we've got this guy paul bettles uh he argues uh that language and structure so now we're moving out of defining the genre by theme and moving into like how can we look at language and structure to define these define these genres and that's kind of where scholarship has moved in the most in in more recent years um is is looking granularly at the words word choice at the grammar choice, all this kind of stuff. So he looks at what he calls traditional openings. And he says the traditional opening, which occurs in many poems, contains genre specific clues that alert the audience to the manner of poem, uh, what manner of poem will follow. Analysis of the traditional opening reveals three distinct kinds of verse, epic, elegy, and wisdom poetry. Uh, the thing is, so for elegy, he says you should see an introductory element, a reference to the narrator, uh, mention of a specific matter, uh, specification of the time and or place, desire to relate the experience, and assertion of personal nature of the experience, which must be characterized by sorrow or anxiety, um, or and anxiety. So the thing is, though, is he comes up with these these very sort of clear lines of what what each traditional opening looks like, and then he like admits that throws it out the window. window. Right, like he's like, well, you know, some poems that we don't generally consider elegiac follow this mold, and a bunch of the one or some of the ones that we consider elegiac don't follow this mold. So it's it's a weird, like I thought that was pretty weird. Um, one of the theses I read this week, one of the 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 one that I really kind of focused on, um, was by a woman uh, who is now a doctor uh, and, and still presumably a woman, um, Stephanie Opfer. Uh, she got her doctoral, this was 2017, she submitted her doctoral thesis uh, at the University of Northern Illinois. Um, and she, what she ended up looking at, she used what's called uh, systemic functional linguistics um, to analyze the, the elegies, looking at specific word choices, specific grammar choices, you know, what mood are the verbs in? We talk about verbal mood, you can have um, subjunctive, all this kind of stuff, right? Like, so what are the choices that are made? And she actually argues that um, you you need to alternate. It's a rel her definition is that it's a relatively short, reflective or dramatic poem, similar in style and content to other elegiac poems um, that alternates between the first and third person perspectives. Includes themes of exile, imagery of water, the sea, the earth, or weather, and words expressing both joy and sorrow. And she argues that really. 
there's only five elegiac poems. So you've got The Wanderer, which were one of the two we're talking about today, Seafarer, Wolf and Edwasser, Wife's Lament, and the Rhyming Poem. So she discounts uh, Deor. And Deor is actually, we're going to talk about that, but um, it is one of the ones that when we talk about what is and isn't an elegy, it pops up pretty frequently in the like, but is it an elegy? Right. It, it does seem to be kind of Right. Yes, you could put it into that bucket, uh, but not, you know. Yeah, it's it, when we talk about elegy by theme, it tends to fall in there because it is very clearly sort of, it's got that elegiac mood. But when we yeah. talk about elegy by structure, that's where things get a little fuzzy. Oh, um, yeah. So let's talk about, uh, we've talked, you know, I, I mentioned here sort of the granularity that we're looking at. And the, the granularity is one of the big problems because it's important to remember that the Exeter book does not present any of these poems the way that we're used to seeing them. So when we think today about how we, how Anglo-Saxon poetry, Old English poetry looks, right? So I don't know if that's gonna work, but you can see here, like it's broken up by line. They've got the the breaks in the middle of the line. The pauses, yeah. Right, yeah. and it's it's broken up into into specific sentences. But that's not how the the Exeter book presents them, right? The Exeter book presents this as it looks much more like a paragraph. It's just a big block of text on the page. Um, so any translation work tends to start from an edited text. Um, and, and there's been different editors have come along and they've read different things into what they're seeing on the page. They normalize spellings. They make assumptions about compound words. Um, and it's so... So you've got to understand that that when we approach these poems, we're approaching them th through multiple layers. Most people don't start from the Exeter book text because it's starting from the text itself. It is difficult um, because we've got like like the punctuate. Just just thinking about punctuation alone um, in the text, we've got the punctus, which is a dot sort of in the middle of the line. Uh, when we think about the the line like a sender, d sender, right? So in the middle of that line, like that. Um, and it, it represents a short pause. You've got the punctus versus, which in uh, the Exeter book is two dots with like a seven on its side next to it. And that indicates a full stop, but that's only used at the very end of the poem. So it's, most of these poems are internally, almost I think all of them are internally broken up into sentences. Those sentences are not represented by a full stop uh, in the actual document. So those, some of that is the editor just saying like, Mm, you know, right. this is where I think right. the sentence ends. Um, and then we've got the spaces between the words, which for us today, right, we don't think about whether the space between two words has any meaning. But for the, the writer of the Exeter book, it did. Um, so we have a lot of compound words. Old English is a compounding language. You can mush two words together. A lot of Old English names, like uh, my SCA name, Kinnehild, uh is a sort of Middle English variant on Old English Kunehild sounds very different, you can tell, um, right? But it's it's a, it's got a proto-theme, Kuna, uh, which means like bright or shining, which incidentally, my real name is Claire, which means bright or shining. Um, and then Hild, uh, which is like battle or victory. Um, so Kunehild, shining victory. Uh, so, so between, you'll, you'll see spaces though. So I write it all as one word and most editors today when they're writing out the, in the old English, they, they take those compound words and they move them together. Um, but in the Exeter book, you tend to see a space between the two words and it's, we talk about minims. So this is, we're gonna do a little bit of deep catechology talk here. So a minim is when you write, thinking about calligraphy, right? You start the letter I, that is a minim. The, the width of the letter I that, that initial stroke, that is one minimum wide. Right, um, so and like pen width, basically. Right, so we put one minimum, sorry, two minims between uh, comp the, the proto-theme and the deuterotheme of a compound word. A space of one minimum is used after a preposition, after adverbs and conjunctions with particles of negation, with uh, se, seo, and the, which is a determiner, um, so that's the, uh, and with prefixes and with blending of sort of neighboring sounds. Um, so that's right. And, and just visually, when you look at the manuscript and you think about this person, this is a, a single person writing this out, right? 
when you write by hand, do you get the number of spaces between words exactly right every time? No. No. No, you don't. So, so and, and sometimes this means that you bounce to the next line. So is that a space between a compound word or have we just bounced right. to the next line? Right. Question. Um, we also see a space of five minims that appear to represent a metrical space. Um, and, and like I said, though, it's, it's all kind of fluid. So this gets us into some real trickiness, especially with the poem Deor, uh, which we're going to talk about next, uh, because there is, um, there's a big question around one of the character's names. Is it a name? Is it a noun and a name? Is it two nouns? Right. Right. No. Because it, uh, yeah. we can't, uh, we can't ask. So anyway, that is uh, kind of what I wanted to say about Elegy and about the Exeter book itself and sort of problems that we face with any of this translation. Right. And yeah, the, the translation issue is, you know, and, and, and thinking about the spacing between the words absolutely can change interpretations. Man, I can hear them like yelling at each other. I don't know if anyone else can hear this, but they are like <laughs> yelling at each other over my head. Um, yeah, it is. So it is a harder to, to look at it and, and you know, read it and be like, does, does this go together? Does that go together? Um, and I actually did not realize that in the Exeter, the original Exeter texts, they were paragraph blocks. I just assumed that they were written out in the, you know, in the whatever meter. Um, it makes sense giving resources to, you know, squish it all into a paragraph, but it makes me wonder, I mean, did this start from a, um, a spoken history that right. everybody just knows where those, where the meter is, right? And, and I would think so, but uh, you're, you're the language expert. So there is, there is a lot of debate about how much of this poetry originates in an oral tradition. Does it originate as oral poetry that's written down immediately? Is it written down first, but designed to be read aloud? And the, the theories tend to point to at least some oral component because right. alliterative verse doesn't make sense on a page. Like you don't get the impact of the alliteration if you're just looking at it. You right. have, need to hear you it. You have to hear it. You have to at least read it in your head, you know, read it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, and so so like this is this is the first um, we'll call it sentence of of Deor, right? Oftim an haga ara yabidath, metudas milze, theach the on a mond kerach, yeon lagulada, longa shoulder, hereren mid heondum, hrimchel de sa, huadn rock clasters, weird with full arad. Right, so you've, you've got metudas milze, mod kerach, um, uh, lagulada longa, hreren hondum hrimchelda. Uh, Waden Raka Klastas Weird, right? Like you don't, if you're just looking at it, you're not going to get the rhythm of that. The rhythm and yeah, exactly. Right, so exactly. whether it was written oral, it was pro uh, initially produced orally and then written down, or, you know, it was written with the intention of it being a spoken poem and that's how it was going to be performed. Right. That's, that's a debate that I'm not, I, I don't have a firm... <laughs> feeling on one way or the other. But I, I think that the argument that this is never intended to be oral poetry is frankly kind of full of it, right? Like I think I think that's a flawed a right. flawed theory, right? Because I it it really does bring so much life to it when you read it out loud and and you know or you know sound it out as it were right. just and, to and, bring it. And knowing that that alliteration there is part of what helps us in editing and preparing the poem because we know that, that each line has to have a certain amount of alliteration and and there are some very strict rules about meter in Old English poetry and so, are not strict. There's some guidelines about- There's, meter in Old there's English nothing poetry. strict about any ancient language. Don't even lie to me. That's okay. That's not true. Jokovit is very strict, but- um, Oh, well, okay. That is, yeah, okay. You're all right. You are totally uh, but, correct in that. But, you know, there, there are some some pretty firm guidelines about, so we can, we can make some pretty- safe guesses, but then there gets to be trickiness about the name of Hilda. So let's, let's talk about Dare. Let's, let's move into uh, this yep. poem. Move into Dare. And by the way, that was the first chunk of Wanderer, not Dare. Um, 
I, yeah, I wondered about that. I haven't read the, the uh, old English, but I'm like, that doesn't sound quite bad. Yeah. So, so here, here's the first chunk of day. Whalen Tim be Wurman Rachas Kininda, An Hidig Erol, Eorfotha Dreach, Haf to him to Yasitheth Sorgo on Langath, Winter Child Racha, Wayan of Onfond, Sithen Hina Nithad on Neda Legada, Swankra Seona Benda on Sulan Man, thus offer Eoda, this is Swamai. So this this introduces us. Uh, so Deor this introduces us sort of to the world of Deor. Deor is just just it's a one. It's it's a really beautiful poem. Like I, it's one that I really love. But what it does is it goes through some sort of well known in the cultural context stories. So the story of Wayland the Smith um, uh, in the Old Norse context, he's called uh, Volander, um, but he is sort of this famous smith of various great weapons and it sticks around so uh when we talk about the the matter of france which are the the medieval heroic uh romantic poems of this charlemagne and his court some of charlemagne's knights have weapons made by voland or wayland right like it's it's that built into the sort of cultural mythos that all right if you have if you have a magic sword it's probably it's made probably. by wayland got it but wayland and uh, gets captured, uh, and 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 so that's what this is talking about. Wayland knew the torment of the serpents upon him. Resolute man, he had suffered hardships. He had sorrow and longing for his companions, the pain of winter cold. He had often encountered misfortunes since Nithad had laid constraints upon him. So here Nithad is the guy, uh, the king, who captures, and I think he's a king of the Geats or the Goths, um, who captures Wayland and forces him to make weapons for him. Uh, as, uh, since Nithad had laid the constraints upon him, supple sinew bonds upon the better man, as that passed over, so can this. So, so that's like, it doesn't give us the whole story there, but it gives you sort of a window into the story that, that the audience hearing this poem would be well aware of. Um, and then it moves on. It says, Beata Hild was not so pained in spirit about her brother's death as it was as about her own situation, that she had previous perceived clearly that she was pregnant. She could not even consider without fear what she should do about that. As that passed over, so will this. So that feels like it's a giant, like to a modern audience, that's a big shift. You know, we were talking about Wayland and this huge is, jump. Now we're talking about this woman. But to the audience, they would know Beato Hild is Nithad's daughter. Um, and the brothers that she's crying about are the brothers that Wayland kills and feeds to Nithad in a pie. So, so that, yeah, we're getting very Game of Thronesy here briefly, right? Right, right. I guess Game of Thronesy got pretty, Game of Thrones, <laughs> Game of Thrones got pretty Waylandy, right? So, right. so um, like, like the audience would know this is all one narrative. Um, so Beato Hild, and Beato Hild is either seduced or raped, kind of depending on the version, by Wayland, and he, she becomes pregnant with his child, um, if I'm remembering that story right. Now I'm really wishing that I had made notes about it. We're um, gonna go with it. So, right, so so that's those two stories connect together. Then we talk about this this woman, Methhild, and the passion of the Geet was bottomless, and that this sorrowful love deprived her of all sleep as that passed over, so too will this. That one's the big question. We're gonna talk a little bit about what's called, what I'm calling the Math Hilda controversy because this is where that, that editing thing happens, right? Like is Math Hilda a name? It's not, it's nowhere else in the old English corpus is that name attested. And right. there's no surviving contemporary reference to Math Hild and the Geet. Um, so it's it's a big question mark. And then we kind of leave Wayland behind a little bit, except for that there are connections between Theodoric um, and the Wayland story, um, like genealogical, sort of mythical genealogical connections. So Theodoric possessed the city of the Marings for 30 winters that was known to many. As that passed over, so too will this. And Theodoric here, so Theodoric the Great, um, a Gothic king, he gets kind of two versions in Germanic mythology. Sometimes he's Theodoric the Great. He is this all powerful conquering king, but to the church, he's also the king that conquered Rome. And 
wasn't really particularly well thought of because he's the wrong kind of Christianity. So the Goths practice what's called Aryan Christianity. Um, important to remember here, Aryan doesn't mean Aryan like Nazi. It means Aryan as in follow, follower of the Bishop Arius. So A-R-I-A-N is, is the word you're looking for. Um, so so he's the, to the church, Theodoric is not necessarily a great dude. Um, and he shows up later uh, as Dietrich of Bern. Um, uh, so there's there's a whole series of, of sort of medieval, uh, high medieval Germanic stories about German stories about Dietrich of Bern, and that's Theodoric the Great. Um, he also survives in the Old Norse corpus as uh, Thiedrecker. So you'll see that name show up in the Old Norse corpus as this, this king, and it's the same guy. Uh, and then we move on from there uh, to really... So this is this is kind of my favorite chunk. Wey shearon ermon riches, wulfne ye theocht, achta wide folk, gotten a riches, that was grim kinning. Sach seach monag, sorgum mi bunda, weon on winan wuste ye neacha, that thus kinning riches over cum and wara, thus of reoda, this is swamai. So so that was grim keening, right? We know what that means. I love that. That was, right? and it is way better in the old English than, I mean, it's good in the, in, in the modern English, but that's way better. Right, but, but, but it's like, to a modern, oh, okay. that was grim keening. You know what that means. That was a grim king. Grim king. Um, which which our translator here and I'm, I'm reading from the, the um, uh, Blackwell Publishing translation. So it's edited by Traharn. Um, uh, so we have discovered the wolfish thought of Ermenric, another Gothic king. Um, he widely ruled the people of the kingdom of the Goths. That was a cruel king. Many men sought, sat bound by sorrows and expectation of misfortune would often wish that in his that his kingly power would be overcome as that passed away. So too will this. So now we've got Ermenric, another bad king. So we've got, now we, we've done some Wayland. We've got a big question mark. And then we move on to two kings that are kind of bad guys that like, bad guys to the church at least right yeah. Yeah. that you know like their their rule their cruel cruel rule is overcome right so then we move finally on to the last stanza which is talking about uh which is getting us into that that elegiac mood where we've got that expression of things that are lost and that can't they're that irre irrecoverable joyed past and now we're just sort of miserable and maybe seeking a little consolation. So he talks about filled with anxiety and care, he sits deprived of happy times, grows dark in spirit. It seems to him that his share of hardships is endless. Then he is able to consider that throughout this world, the wise Lord often causes change. He shows favor to many men, certain prosperity to some, a portion of misfortune. I want to reveal about myself that I was the shop of the Heodings for a while. Dear to my Lord, my name was Deor. I had a good position in service for many winters. A loyal Lord until now Heorenda, a man skilled in poetic craft, has received the land rights that my protector of men formerly gave to me as that passed over. So too will this. So, so Deor, the word Deor means dear. So there's there's a question like is Day or his name or is that just like the nickname that his lord gave him? Right. Um, so he says my name was Day. Was right. Right, and is no longer you know clearly this 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 person is no longer the favored. Yeah. The, you know the the favorite of the of the lord uh, and the lord here being king right not lord. Well, Go yeah, on, yeah. Lord. This is not is capital it? L Lord. This is right. not God. Um, it's not God. So, so the wise, when we talk about the wise Lord, that's God. That's yes. capital L Lord. Yes. Um, uh, but it's it's it does get pretty tricky because uh, Drifna or Drifton, excuse me, Drifton uh, does it means both God and your your earthly Lord, um, right. and it's used in both places. Uh, just, so you know, just to add to confusion. Yeah. Why not? Why not make it a little tricky? Um, but what's great is this poem, the way this poem ends, right? So we've got the expression of sorrow for times gone by, a little bit of consolation where he turns to God and he, you know, God, God does these things. He, he gives some people joy and prosperity and to other people he gives misfortune. And that's, we should accept that, right? Like that is fate. And it's a lot part of, of, a lot of the way of in the world. Fate. Yep. 
that's a, a big theme in old English poetry. Um, you know, but it ends, we've talked about that sort of old Norse wit where it's like spears are in season these days, right? Like you've got to go out with a good bon mot. Right. Here we, we're going out with a little bit of a bon mot too, because he's like, you know, I had this great life and now that life belongs to hair. Some of it belongs to somebody else, but what? the same way I lost it, you're going to lose it too. Right. So, yeah. so it, it ends with a little bit, there's a little sass, there's a little side eye where he's like, armor hair and um so you know that's so that's Deor. uh but let's let's talk now a little bit because you know we've we've plowed on for an hour and we've still got another poem to get through um, i know we're uh, not good at keeping this to an hour sorry everybody sorry, <laughs> sorry. um let's talk about moth hilda is it a name should it be moth space hilda um there is there are two uh, 19, uh, two ballads, Scandinavian ballads that are recorded in the 19th century that reference the characters that this may be discussing. So uh, Matilda is a version of Mothhild and Geet, uh, they may be, may, the, this is, this is uh, one of the, the, the articles. Um, they may have been as famous as Romeo and Juliet in their day, but only a fragment of this, of their story has survived to us. Um, and it's not really from medieval sources, but Scandinavian ballads recorded in the 19th century. Magenhild, again, question mark, is this a form of Mothhild, uh, wept, apparently because she foretold that she would drown in a river. Gauti, uh, Geet, retorts that he will build a bridge over the river, um, but she notes that she, no one can flee fate. So again, we're back to that, like, your fate is fully fixed. Um, sure enough, she's drowned. She either falls off the bridge or the bridge collapses. Um, and uh, Gauti calls for his harp. Uh, and like a Germanic Orpheus, he plays so well that his body, wife's body rises out of the waters. In one version, she comes back alive. In the other version, she's dead. Um, but just like he gets her body back and he buries her properly. And then, so Hi. here's the thing, guys. Um, yeah. There's a poem, uh, Cruel Sister, or no, yep. a song, Cruel Sister, right? Cruel, yeah, 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 yeah. I love that song. I, I hate that song, okay? <laughs> and I, I despise it. And there's there's this great recording out there somewhere of, of uh, Sir Cyrus and I mocking that song, just hardcore. We were both pretty drunk and we just oh, were like going in on the song. But like yes, we were at a Bardic and we were trying to sing Cruel Sister and we're just like at it. Um, anyway, so he they, they make a harp strings out of hair and so the same thing happens in this this ballad as he makes new strings for his harp from her hair. And I just briefly want to point out, hair is a bad. It doesn't, it doesn't work no, like that. No, and hair it does from not work. Body is not going to have the elasticity. That's no. why you use gut. You're going to make yeah. strings for your heart. Make them out of her intestine. Do right. Make them out of her hair. Hair is not the 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 material for that. I. Right. It just. Like, I mean, it's easier to get, I suppose, but it's just not going to work as well. Like that's that's I think the origin part of the origin of my hatred of that song is that it's just like you listen like that's not how musical it's, instruments work. Right. It's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. <laughs> Right. So anyway, so there's that. Um, there's an article called Unediting uh, Deor, which uh, was written by a gentleman named uh, Vladimir Bruljak. Um, he argues that the reading of Mothheld is syntactically suspect, if not outright impossible. Um, so he says, you know, it could be Mothheld, the, the text specifically, let me read you the text in Old English. Hui that Mothhilda monga yefrinan, wurdan gronliesa, yetas frige. That him seo so glufu slaf ela binom, da sofreo da disiswamai. So he argues here that Mathilda could be understood as a genitive, qualifying that, which would uh, then become the object of uh, Yefrinan. So uh, that it would be like that that thing that belongs to Mathilda or Mathilda's thing. That is is like a, a, just like a. Got it. Right? Okay. Yep. Um, yep. But, but that kind of runs us into some issues because then we hit the word monga, which is it a date of singular form of mong, which is an un otherwise unattested uh, Old English word that, that could be uh, cognate with Old Norse mang, which means love commerce. Uh, so <laughs> which that's, that's how it gets translated. I don't quite, I need love commerce, context, right? Like I need a context for what does love commerce? I, I, I mean, it is the oldest profession. But <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, other, uh, but this is kind of a tortured reading. Other translators have argued that uh, Hmong 
uh, monga means like moans or lamentations. Um, there's an author, Conabera, that retains Mavhilda, but translates the line as, um, or, sorry, retains Mavhilda as two words, uh, that neither of them being uh, a name. So he says um, that this would translate as this reward of many a contest have we heard. Other folks keep Hilda as a name, but render Moth as a word meaning like a harvest, uh, which gets kind of tricky because we're not talking about harvests anywhere else. So is this some sort of um, right. theoretical, right. like not theoretical, what's the, there's a word I'm looking for that I'm not coming up with. Um, and then argue that Hild, the Hild here references back to Beato Hild. So it's, it's basically just a callback to the Deutero theme of her name, mm -hmm. um, which would kind of make sense in that that would altogether, that would make the Mav Hilda section fit in with tie um, it the story of Wayland. Right. 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 So that, that makes the whole first section about Wayland. And then we have Theodoric, who is related to Wayland. And then we have Ermenric, who's sort of related to Theodoric by right. both being Gothic kings. So that the argument there is that that, that brings the, the stanzas into like a illogical flow. Right. Um, other authors have said, you know what, this is a list poem, a catalog poem. You don't need logical flow. Right. It's You're fine. just like, sticking just, in. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that, that's, that's where a lot of this debate lies. The other tricky bit in translating is is the refrain, da sofreo da this is swamai, which just FYI, if I ever get a tattoo, there's two things that I would get. One of them is um, my sister and I both really like the beacons in Lord of the Rings. So when the yeah. when beacons of Gondor are lit, beacons. you know, Gondor yeah. calls for aid and Rohan yeah. wants it, right? So that's a, a reference between the two of us that we use a lot. Like if you're having just a deeply shitty day, right. you send the other sister a picture of the beacons and then like, you know, right. you call and you you talk it out. Yeah, um, yep, so we yep. both want to get like a little glyph of a mountain with a beacon. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know where, not on the back of my hand, but. Um, a terrible place. <laughs> right. So that's that's tattoo number one. The other one is the Sobreoda, this is Swamai. Because to me, that's a very meaningful statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like bad days happen, they pass yep. away, they're all in the past, so too will this. Yep. But what does what does that mean? Like it, it, it gets translated most frequently as that passed over, so can this. Um, my other book here, let me flip to the right page. Your four pound book. My giant, my new book, my pretty book, my precious. Um, so this one translates it as, again, that passed over, so can this. Um, but Ofreoda is interesting because Ofreoda can also mean to overcome. Uh, so to over overrun, to conquer, um, to so overroad huh. is the modern English uh, descendant of that. Right. Um, uh, to transgress, to go across, to traverse. So and then the the formation of it. Uh, thus and this is. Uh, thus is um, a genitive form of say, which is the so the thing, but it's of the thing. Um, and then this is is again genitive of this, which is this. So of of this thing. And that's a formation that's not generally recorded anywhere, especially with Ofreoda. You don't see that uh, Ofregan, sorry, Ofregan is the, the, the root verb um, with that genitive anywhere else. So there's a lot of speculation. Uh, the current sort of dominant position is that the verbs here are in, impersonal and that the genitives, though not exampled so elsewhere, um, are sort of of respect to the thing. So it passed over with respect to that. It may also pass over with respect to this. Um, and that's uh -huh. that's uh, sort of clinic's position. Um, it passed over, uh, uh, another argument is, is that it's sort of an adverbial sense um, of a point in time from which something happens. So it passed over from that and it can from this. Another possibility is um, that these are both objects, uh, an ofragan uh, taking the, the genitive because in its sense here includes the notion of gaining or of possessing and ruling. So he conquered that, I may also conquer this. Um, so these are, these are existing in sort of the mind of these scholars when they're reading this poem. And I think when, when the rest of us sort of non-academic people are reading this poem, it's important to keep in mind that the translation is not fully fixed. Fate. Right your fate is fully fixed, your translations aren't. 
Um, <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> right. So it's, 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 it's just, it's, 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 it's very, I think, fascinating um, thing to think about. Uh, is this even an elegy? Uh, it gets grouped in with wisdom poetry pretty frequently, though, unlike right. a lot of the wisdom poetry where it's giving you explicit statements of like, this is how to live a good life. The day order doesn't do that quite as much. Um, uh, the Dr. Stephanie Opfer, who I mentioned previously, she says that there's not really images of the sea or the earth or weather. Um, though I would point out that it does talk about the pain of winter cold, winter chelda. Um, so I'm not, uh, it doesn't no, fit. Yeah, I don't totally discount the. Yeah, but it the, also, it doesn't fit reference. her, uh, what's called lexomics analysis. So okay. that's, that's the rest of where her argument is coming and that I'll totally give her. Um, Nicholas Howe in 1985 argues that Deor is a catalog poem and uh, whether in prose or poetry, it's a practical means of presenting a great deal of information in discrete sections. So he, he's one of the ones arguing that it's okay that the, the story doesn't really flow from one event to the next because it's a catalog. It's just telling us these are stories that you should know and have in your mind as I talk about my life. Right. Um, so that's what I've got with... Uh, that's what I've got about Deor. Do we want to move on to Wanderer? Let's move on to the Wanderer. So, um, yeah, the Wanderer. All right. A uh, couple of interesting things about the Wanderer. It's um, it starts with a narrator introdu introducing a monologue of of another person, and then concludes with a narrator as well. Um, there are um, Christian and pagan overtones because a narrator references God and the importance of faith. Um, in both the opening and the closing, but the wanderer himself uh, is talking about loyalty, generosity, tribal values, much more pagan viewpoints. Um, the story itself is, uh, it's an aging warrior, wandering, seeking aid and shelter. This does have the water references. Uh, he's out at sea. Uh, at one point he, he wakes up in a, a snow and a hailstorm at sea. That sounds terrible to me. Um, and it's really the, this, his lament of his exile and the loss of his, his kin, his home, his friends, his king. So we have that same theme of, of this earthly Lord is gone and, and this man's place in that hall is gone. Um, so it's, you know, it's a reflection of his, of his fate, resignation, control of emotions as a way of meeting adversity, uh, Interesting. So he he also uh, in his travels he he see, comes he sees ruins he sees like broken down walls, compares it to his own past, and how you know the past that he had is gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Transience is is like is is a major theme in all of these poems, right? The Absolutely. Transience of the world that we love, right? is it's, it's always it's always impermanent it's, a, it's always it's going a, it's, away it's a transmutation it's it's yeah it's the the things of it's that nostalgia and that yeah. the things of our past are gone now here mm -hmm. are the things of my past but here is you know and sometimes it's i've seen it, it's the I, I don't know what the future holds right um but it's really looking at mortality life's transience um and the record, the, the, so you need to talk about, I can't even pronounce it, Ubi, Ubi Sunt poetry. Okay, so. Which is super cool. And I knew nothing about it until like four days ago. <laughs> so um, really quickly though, on the transients. Uh, so so big theme is always transients of the, the material world is going to go away. And the consolation for that transients is that we should, we should look to God. Yes. Um, so the wanderer and so spoke the wise man in his mind, he sat apart in secret meditation. It is good for him who retains his faith. Never shall a man express too quickly the grief from his heart, unless beforehand he might know how to bring about the cure, an earl with courage. It will be well with him who seeks mercy, consolation from the father in heaven, where for all of us secure, where for us all security stands. So he took the so, words right out of my mouth. Right. I was totally gonna like, read that. This is all. I'm sorry. It's, no, no, it's fine. And it's yeah. And it's and so and but note that that's the narrator. Yeah. Saying that that conclusion piece, right? Yeah. Right. Like so. So we've got this warrior whose lord is dead. Um, explicitly, he he uh, covered 
So far from my gener uh, since years ago, my generous Lord, I covered in the earth's hiding place and wretched, I went went from there, winter sorrowing over the bounding waves, sat at the loss of the hall, sought a giver of treasure where I might find near or far, he who might show me affection in the mead hall or would comfort me friendless, entertain me with joys. So his old Lord is dead and now he's got to find a new home. He's a Ronin out in the world, wandering, looking for a new, a new master. Um, and, you know, he's, he's presumably he's an older man, you know, maybe nobody wants him and they're, they're right. 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 It's and hard so to, it's, you know, it's hard to, for aging warriors to find work. Right. So he's, he's deprived of all these joys. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and now he's friendless. He's alone. He's often, uh, therefore he knows who must long forgo his beloved Lord's counsel when sorrow and sleep both together often bind the wretched man. It seems to him in his mind that he embraces and kisses his Lord and on his knee might lay his hands and head as before he sometimes enjoyed the gift, enjoyed the gift school, stool in days of old. So it's this very personal relationship. Right. Like he, the, the fellows at the mead bench, that's all, all of that. That's your, your social support system mm -hmm, mm -hmm. gone away. They must um, be going through a pandemic right now. I, this, <laughs> this, so that's one of the things I want to talk about. This yeah. poem to me is so meaningful right now, right. especially for those right. of us, like we're the SCA, right? Like that's our social structure. That's our social support system. My friends yeah almost all in the SCA, not, not everybody. I've got a couple, I've got a couple of non SCA friends. Like sometimes I go hang out with them. Um, but for the most part we're yeah. Right. But most of my friends are here and the, these great memories I have are largely right. built around SCA experiences, going to wars, yeah. sitting at the bench by the fire. Yes. Yeah, telling stories and right? with like people. That, there's this warm embrace that is, this was, yeah, that this whole poem really, like that's what I what what hit home for me of when reading this again was like it's it's so familiar to me right now. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm gonna read the, the last couple stanzas of the of the the warriors um monologue. And it's this is where we get, and you can talk where we can both talk about more. Um, the there's a lot of Tolkien Tolkienish. Yeah, Tolkien is, he's still yeah. half of his stuff. Uh, but, uh, and, I, and I love this because you can, when I read this, you'll, you'll hear the, the Tolkien in it. Yeah. Um, uh, where am I? Where has the horse gone? Where has the man gone? Where are the treasure givers gone? Uh, where has the place of banquets gone? Where are the joys of the hall? Alas, the gleaming cup, alas, the armored warrior. Alas, the prince's glory, how the time has passed grown dark under the helm of night as if it never were. There stands now in the track of the dear retainer, a wall, wondrously high, adorned with serpent patterns. The might of ash spears snatched, snatched away noble men, weapons greedy for carnage, notorious fate, and storms beat the stone heaps. Falling snowstorms bind the earth, winter's chaos, then the darkness comes. Night shadows spread gloom, sending from the north, fierce hail, hail, hail storms to the terror of men. All is hardship in the earthly kingdom. The operation of fate changes the world under the heavens. Here wealth is transitory. Here a friend is transitory. Here a man is transitory. Here a kinsman is transitory. All this earth's foundations will become empty. Damn. Like, <laughs> and then it goes into the, the narrator saying, so spoke the wise man, you know, it's good to have faith. It's good to, you know, so all of the warriors, everything is, is gone and uh, it's taken away by the, the carnage and the weapons and, and ash spears. So, and that's um, the, and I hadn't caught this before because I'll, I'll be totally honest. I have not actually read a lot of Tolkien because I find it to be tedious. I know I'm probably not, I'm going to get kicked out of the SCA now, but whatever. Um, so yeah, the, the wanderer, uh, do you want to read the, the, uh, the, bleh, the old English? Um, yeah, so, um, really cool. cool. So can I read this other translation? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, um, this is an example of how translators change the text of the poem as they're working through it. This is the uh, Craig Williamson translation. The why, uh, where is it? Uh, where has the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gifts? Where is the seat of feasting? Where is the hall joy? 
Gone is the bright cup, gone is the mailed warrior, gone is the glory of the prince, how the time has slipped down under the night helmet as if it never was. The only thing left is the traces, is traces of the tribe, a strange high wall with serpentine shapes, worm-like strokes, what's left of runes. The strength of spears has borne off earls, weapons, weedy, weapons greedy for slaughter, some glorious fate. Raging storms crash against the stone cliffs, swirling snow blankets and binds the earth. Winter howls as the pale night shadow darkens, sending rough hailstorms from the north, bringing savagery and strife to the children of men. Hardship and suffering descend on the land. The shape of fate is twisted under heaven. Life is on loan. Here goods are fleeting. Here friends are fleeting. Here man is fleeting. Here kith and kin are fleeting. Everything passes. All of this early, earthly foundation stands empty and idle. So like you've got, it's, it's a slightly different text. Um, they're, but they're both coming from the same original English, old English. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that I'm not going to read the whole chunk in old English, um, but I'm going to read a couple of chunks. Uh, the, the first is, is what we call the Ubi Sons. So that's the where is the horse and where is the the rider and where's in in Tolkien where is the horse and where is the rider where is the horn that was blowing where is the helm and the halberd and the bright hair flowing so Tolkien yep. leans more into the rhyme that rhyme is not really part of old English poetry. And then we, you know, we go on, we talk about all these awful things, and then we sort of make explicit statement of the things that are transitory. Here with Feoch Lana, here with Freund Lana, here with Mon Lana, here with Mag Lana, e alla this eorthen yseto, idel weorpeth. So that's the bit, you know, here goods are fleeting, here friends are fleeting, here man is fleeting, here kin is fleeting, everything passes away. All this earthly foundation stands empty and idle. Um, okay. And that's that's so not, interesting that that uh, translation has uh, it stands empty and idle, as in as in current state stands. Uh, this other the black it's not the Blackwell the other translation that we were I read earlier is uh, yeah. all the Earth's foundations will become empty, so it's a future state. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting because it's I don't know again I'm not the linguist but generally I, I it's. I find it strange that there's a there's a, a future state in one translation and a, a current state in a different translation, but so that's just English me not being a linguist. <laughs> right, Old English is a little bit tricky in expressing future. Um, you can express the past just fine, but when we talk about expressing the future, a lot of it is built on uh, context. Right. Um, right. So and we don't have the full context here for everything. Which, modern English still, right, to build the future tense, we, we don't have a conjugation of an independent verb. We have to use uh, helper right. verbs to create this sense of future. So yeah, not like Latin where you can just use one word and it's the future suddenly. Um, Magic. Magic. So, so the, the folks who are familiar with Tolkien will hear this and they'll think of the lament of the Rohirrim. Mm -hmm. Right, and the Rohirrim in Tolkien's world, the Rohirrim are the stand-in for these these early medieval English people. Absolutely. And the, the poem there is, where now is the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the halberd and the bright hair flowing? Where is the hand on the harp string and the fire red fire glowing? Where is the spring and the harvest and the tall corn growing? They have passed like rain on the mountain, like wind in the meadow. The days have gone down in the west behind the hills in shadow. Who shall gather the smoke and the dead wood burning or behold the flowing years from the sea returning? So you've got a lot of the same themes and, and mm -hmm. the direct lift of where comer, where comer, right? right? <laughs> where's the horse and where's the, the horse? Rider? Where's the rider? I right. It just, <laughs> just like this is, it's, it means a lot to me, right? Um, if, if for folks who didn't know, my license plate is a reference to the endonym of the Rohirrim. So like, I have a lot of love for the people of Rohan. <laughs> well, because they are the best people in the Tolkien so, world. So I'm sorry, but Carl Urban is real pretty. So oh, yeah, that too. 
right? Oh, yeah. Like he puts on the armor and the hair and it's just, I have a whole moment. So anyway, wow. that's not the point. The point is this beautiful poetry. Um, so what is an ubisunt? Uh, you'd asked me that a while ago, but I got sidetracked. An ubisunt yeah. is a type of sort of poetic moment. Um, and it, it's, it starts with Latin poetry. We've got some great Latin examples. Um, anybody who's ever had to, uh, not had to, anybody who's ever taken the time to study Galliard, Galliard verse, which is a high medieval um, form of type of music uh, that came out of uh, these, these early universities. So it's, it's, it's student songs, right? And there's a famous one that people still sing today um, that starts, Ubi sunt qui antino sin mundo fuere, right? Ubi sunt. Um, uh -huh. So that starts, you know, where are those who came before us in this world? Um, right. And then the, this, the poem goes on to talk about they've, they've died and gone away and, and now we're here and we're get drunk, right? Like it's a drinking song. 90% um, of Galliard songs are about drinking or sex. Like that's as college students are want to focus. Right? Like, I, I, think I see nothing wrong with that. This is, this is, this is a, tr a longstanding tradition. Um, so we, we see Obi's sons early and then the, the, this sort of, they, they, they're so perfect though for this elegiac mood that we see an adoption of them into Old English poetry. The most perfect example is here in the Wanderer where it's literal ubisons, right? Like it's it's where are, which is what ubison translates to. Um, if you're ever curious, by the way, of, of keeping ubi straight in your head, what it means, um, semper ubi sub ubi is a great Latin phrase that I use to keep in mind. Uh, and it means always wear underwear. Um, so semper always ubi where, uh, semper ubi sub under ubi where, always where okay. under where, semper ubi good, sub ubi. Good to know. Yeah. And now all you right. all remember it forever. So right. uh, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's ubi some poetry. It's, it's these rhetorical questions. It builds on nostalgia. And again, we're back to that meditation on mortality and life's transience, which is what this is all about. All. Yep. Yep. It really is. It's just all about the transience of, of life and hall and I don't know where we're going tomorrow and don't, yeah. Like yep. everything is fleeting. Life is fleeting. So but also don't you know, dwell in the past, like reminisce, remember the past, but know that it's going to change. Don't live there. Yeah. Don't live there. Um, all right. So, Goodness. Yeah. Good lessons for life in a pandemic. Right. Don't It'll all pass eventually. So uh, right. I think that's, yeah, we've been going for a bit over an hour. Um, I, I'm we're actually pretty impressed. I was afraid we were gonna, we kind of we kind of crammed in the last end of it there, but we have done it. Uh, there's people that have still stuck with us. Uh, fantastic. I love all of those nerds. Um, so we, um, I wanted to share something that I just learned yesterday or earlier this week. Um, the Smithsonian uh, has a, an online transcription center. So if you are interested and have the ability to read old uh, documents, and right now they're actually um, being Black History Month, they are focusing on old plantation records and slave documentation. Um, and they've also, they've kind of done other subsets, there's women's history and stuff like that. But um, if you are interested and have, you know, an hour or whatever to spare a week, you can go to transcription.si.edu or just search for the Smithsonian Transcription Center and you can sign up. Um, I just signed up yesterday and got like the welcome email and you have to read and agree to, you know, the terms, and, but it's super easy. Uh, and they, you, you do a transcription, send the uh, electronic document to basically a peer review. They read the original, they read the transcription, make any corrections, kick it back, whatever. Uh, and then it goes to a uh, Smithsonian staffer for final approval um, and kind of and publication, however it goes up there. So uh, I, I plan on doing that. My company is also quite generous and they pay me for, or they, they, I'm sorry, they don't pay me. They donate to organizations for volunteer time. Um, I don't know, maybe other companies do that. Uh, so I, not only will I get to do something that will exercise my brain a little bit and help uh, preserve history going forward, but the Smithsonian will get a donation from my company. So, um, and then you have a super cool thing. Yeah, so um, 
there is a, a woman, uh, her name is uh, Jivanessa Abdullah, and she runs what's called the Digital Museum. She's a Brit uh, and she's been running these, it, the, what the Digital Museum does is it, it hosts these lectures. Um, so the first one I ended up listening to was talking about, this was months ago, and it was talking about um, the slave trade and its impact on Scotland um, and, and like the interconnection between those two. Um, and so that's, that's how I heard about this, but she has continued to host some really outstanding um, scholars. And coming up February 12th, there's gonna be a lecture uh, by Judith Jesh, Professor Judith Jesh um, on Vikings. And so I thought the, the people watching this would probably find that quite interesting. Um, I don't have a link, if, but if you Google the Digital Museum and uh, Jibanessa, um, and I'll put that in the, I'll, I'll post about this on the, the Facebook group and we'll put it in the notes on the YouTube. Um, you'll be able to find, she runs it off, like she's got a Twitter account and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the lectures are free. Downside, it is at, at 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. So if you're in Alaska, <laughs> it's an early morning, um, but it's a slightly less early morning for everybody else, I guess. Right. Um, and, and you know what, well, you have a, um... We have service symposium next weekend, so yep, that's coming up. I'll be up. I'll we'll be awake anyway. Um, it's, oh, we, we should double a, check times with Saga Saturday. I already did. Oh, good. Elsie worked around our schedule because <laughs> Elsie is the best. Yes. So our yes, we're, we're awesome. Our stuff is later in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, that's another great call out if you are service minded at all, uh, or even interested in service minded, uh, your your resident Pelicans here invite you to join the service symposium. Um, you can find it through Facebook and then you don't have to interact with Facebook. It's actually through a separate website. Uh, some great classes that are going to be coming up next weekend. Um, I'm doing court 101 as well as um, co hosting a panel on care and feeding of volunteers in the SCA and a um, an open discussion social sort of thing with uh, Madame Ghislaine on um, uh, it being, I can't remember the exact title that Elsie came up with, but basically it's it's okay to want to be a pelican, come talk to us more. <laughs> it, it's, it's not a bad thing to want to be a pelican. So, and I think I, you're teaching a couple classes too? I'm teaching a class um, oh. on, so you've had a wild idea. So, uh, taking these weird ideas that you have sometimes and can we translate them into SCA events? Can we translate or something else, right? Like right. just how to take an idea that seems a little out of the box and move it Make into it um, a real world application. Awesome. Okay. Now, um, what are we doing next week? Other than service symposium, we are <laughs> We, so, we have a jam-packed weekend next weekend. Yeah, yeah we do. Um, uh, so we are next week is Frau and Leiden Riddles is the title of it. But really, so we're, what we're going to be talking about is Wife's Lament, Wolf and Ed Wasser, and The Husband's Message. And this is kind of the closest I can get to um, Valentine's Day content. Uh, and it's not happy. Like, it's they're separated. They're miserable. So, you know, I guess love grows in absentia or something. Um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but it's it's three poems. They're, they're all three of them are pretty short. They actually tend to get grouped as elegies as we talked about today. Um, but uh, they are often kind of grouped together. And the question is, is are they really related? Um, do they tell a unified story? All that kind of stuff. So that is next week's. Perfect. I think that's awesome. And hopefully um, Bersi will be back with us next week. We'll see. He had a, he had life this week. Um, so I think that wraps it up. I'm going to say thank you to all of the, the lovely people that are watching, still watching. Um, you guys are the, the bestest. Uh, this, you can always find this recording again through Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and that's what we've got. All, all right. right. Bye everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>